Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland used to be characterized by a type of ethnic exclusivity. Two communities in the north and one community in the south. The exclusivity could be observed in the politics, in the social aspirations, and in the communal self-perception. Of course, the truth was always more complex than this, with pockets of indigenous, ethnic, racial, and religious minority groups inhabiting both Northern Ireland and the Republic for many decades. As a result of European politics and migratory flows, immigration boomed in the 1990s, and these minority groups began to grow. Today, for instance, one-fifth of the population in Northern Ireland is neither Protestant nor Catholic. With the growth of hitherto unseen or ignored communities beginning to expand, both the Irish and the Northern Irish have begun to pose questions about the meaning of Irishness or Northern Irishness, citizenship, and multiculturalism. Multiculturalism is both a political concept and a buzzword. As a political concept, it used to describe a culturally diverse society or a policy to promote, some might even say manage, a culturally diverse group. From a multicultural perspective, a plurality of cultures is a desirable end. In this way, we pursue the integration of minority cultures into the larger public sphere without demanding that they efface their identities of origin. Multiculturalism involves a remake of the existing conception of citizenship to facilitate the full integration of newcomers without the loss of cultural identity. Multiculturalism values plurality and identity rather than exclusivity or homogeneity or even blindness. Multiculturalism also does not privilege earlier identities over later ones, dominant ones over minority ones. And it also takes cognizance of power differentials that result from social stratification and seeks to counter them by promoting an equality of outcome rather than an equality of opportunity. Recall our earlier lecture on versions of equality, quality of treatment, quality of opportunities, and equality of results. And through a multicultural lens, the aim is the accommodation of plural identities and equality of outcomes. There is some controversy, there is much controversy to multiculturalism. The unwillingness to privilege earlier or majority cultural groups is a primary source of this controversy. One of the chief criticisms of multiculturalism is that it fails to produce a form of social cohesion. By not placing expectations of assimilation, multiculturalism can lead to a form of segregation and in the worst instances, forms of ghettoization. Some states, such as Ireland, have thus, instead of promoting multiculturalism, pursued a policy of interculturalism. It is understood that through an intercultural lens, emphasis is to be placed on the interactions between dominant and minority groups. The aim is to uncover decision-making patterns and to facilitate the political participation of minority groups. Now, at first blush, interculturalism doesn't sound that much different from multiculturalism. The key distinction, according to proponents, is that the emphasis is on interaction and participation, and this underscores the importance of integration rather than simply cohabitation. Multiculturalism focuses on valuing cultures, interculturalism focuses on developing a new form of social cohesion. This has become the stated agenda of both Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. It is interesting to note that in both countries, despite much in the way of equality legislation and many equality bodies, public recognition of other cultures has been rather slow going. We recall that justice is comprised of three spheres, the economic, the political, and the cultural. Injustice in the cultural sphere occurs when people are denied recognition of their cultural identity. In this way, public misrecognition is itself a form of injustice. Scholars have sourced this seeming unfriendliness towards minority groups in Northern Ireland and the Republic 
to the legacy of British colonialism. In response to British colonialism, the Irish in the Republic and those in the North have developed strong, homogeneous national identities. The Republic has long regarded itself as an ethnically unitary state, and while the North has seen itself as an ethnically bifurcated state. So one community in the Republic and two communities in the North. Other groups were peripheral, if acknowledged at all, and expected to assimilate within the Republic or to simply get out of the way in the North. Increasing diversity, increasing integration within the European Union and migratory flows have, as we said, changed all of this and forced the Irish, have forced the Northern Irish to question what their identities actually mean. To the extent that the inevitability of change was accepted, strategies of either multiculturalism or interculturalism have largely proved ineffective. Let us consider issues of interculturalism or even integration in the Republic through the lens of the veil. Now we'll begin with a quote from Lorraine O'Connor. It also dawned on me that even though I was Irish, as soon as I put on the hijab, I became a foreigner in my own country. And another from a Fingal spokesperson, Irish girls don't wear scarves. The veil says much about the clash between policy or interculturalism and history or Irish monocultural understandings of the Irish identity. To the dominant group, to the dominant Irish group, distinct cultural practices that are celebrated through multiculturalism were regarded as the celebration of difference, creating a sense of vulnerability that manifested as a form of social tension. Difference takes on a pejorative connotation as the practice departs from what many Irish regard as acceptable cultural practice. Irish girls don't wear scarves. According to one feminist scholar, we simply cannot have liberal equality laws and continue to pander to repressive minority customs. To this scholar, equality for Muslim Irish women is achieved through their assimilation into the dominant cultural practices of the Republic. Of course, this position provokes a number of additional questions. Is there one single representation of Irishness? Is it possible for an Irish person to belong to multiple groups simultaneously? Can an Irish person also be a Muslim? In short, is there any nuance to national or personal identity within the Republic? These questions play out via the policy choices that are made by the state. Across the Republic, there has been a debate whether to ban veils in schools. Of course, a similar debate has already taken place in France, though in the French case, the ban was on overt religious symbols in general, a prohibition that ultimately affected members of other religious groups, including Buddhist, Catholic, Jewish, and others. In the Irish case, there were no questions as to whether crucifixes should be prohibited, but simply the cultural religious practice of one particular group. As we observe from the quote from the feminist scholar, these arguments were largely informed by paternalism. We must protect Muslim women, and by national identity, we must preserve Irish culture. An important follow-up question then is how this policy debate is understood through the lens of equality. As much as national identity is a product of culture, it is also a product of law. Strong national identities were constructed in a post-colonial period for a variety of reasons. Even today, this debate rages on as nations such as Australia introduce citizenship tests that query migrants on their understanding of what it means to be Australian. The implication is that Australian identity, or even Irish identity, or even Northern Irish identity is fixed and newcomers must simply assimilate. Multiculturalism, interculturalism, and to a great extent, even liberalism challenge this representation of homogeneous and rigid national identities. 
Hence the clash. Civil rights and human rights are informed by liberalism, as are multiculturalism and interculturalism. One scholar by the name of Kimlicka has argued that the abolition of exclusionary citizenship laws and tests is the first step in the establishment of a multicultural state. The Republic of Ireland has gone in the opposite direction. A referendum was held in 2004 in which the Irish voted in favour of restricting citizenship to people with Irish parents rather than all those born on the island. The Irish approach runs counter to the citizenship laws in Canada and counter to the citizenship laws in the United States, where, ironically, many first and second generation Irish migrants benefited from the multicultural approach to citizenship preferred by these two nations. The referendum takes us a step back from a policy of multiculturalism or even interculturalism and towards a policy of assimilation. Can we reconcile a policy of assimilation with a policy of equality? A failure to assimilate within an assimilationist framework can have dire consequences for the political power of the minority group. We need only look to the circumstances of traveler people who are widely marginalized and rejected across the Republic. Their rejection has led to high levels of discrimination and ensuing inequalities. The crime of traveler people has been their unwillingness or even their incapability of ascribing to the cultural practices of the majority. Social prejudice has led to exclusion and a lowered quality of life as traveler people are precluded from participating in Irish society as equals. Within an assimilationist policy, the burden for cohabitation is on minorities who are called upon to conform to the common identity of the state. This mindset was captured during the hijab debate when the Minister of Education declared that integration requires minorities to embrace our culture. Notions of us and them run counter to multiculturalism, interculturalism, and as should be rather obvious by now, run counter to equality as well. The us versus them narrative has become quite common in Europe, particularly in relation to Muslims, but also with regards to other minority groups such as the Roma. Much of this negativity has been stoked by the media that has provided a heavily biased, even bigoted view of Muslims and other minorities, pre presenting them as threats to a common Irish or a common European identity. Of course, the political establishment hasn't helped. Recall in 2014, the Northern Irish pastor's bigoted tirade against Muslims. What was more worrisome than his comments was the endorsement received from the Northern Irish First Minister, Peter Robinson, who declared that he too did not trust Muslims. This attitude is also prevalent in the Republic, where it has been argued that racism towards minority has now become commonplace. Recall that it was only in 2013 that a child was taken from their parents by the police and forced to undergo DNA testing to confirm that he was, in fact, who his parents said he was. The argument made to justify the abduction of this child was that he did not look like his parents. We can, of course, only speculate that the family's Roma identity had something to do with the state's intervention. We might also inquire as to the frequency with which police take children from their parents because of a supposed lack of resemblance. How often does this happen? What we are observing then is the emergence of a policy that vilifies difference and diversity and that is being carried out at a state and media level and is now filtering through to the population at large. Many Muslim women have recounted having had their scarves pulled off in public. While some have argued that the antipathy has much to do with a desire to maintain a divide between church and state, the claim that either Northern Ireland or the Republic of Ireland are secular places is flawed at best. What appears to be at issue is not religion per se, but non-Christian expressions of religion. Christianity is so imbued within 
the Republic or Northern Ireland, that it is seen as neutral or to a great extent not seen at all. Within public institutions, for instance, the debate has frequently based on the prohibition of the hijab or of turbans worn by the Sikh. Crucifixes, also an overt religious symbol, do not raise an eyebrow. Now seen through this lens, minorities are not being asked to integrate within a neutral culture, but are rather being told that they must conform to the identity of another. What this other identity looks like is unclear. It might be liberal or conservative. It might be socialist or capitalist. It might be patriarchal or egalitarian. It might be Protestant or Catholic, spiritually or culturally religious. It might be atheist or something else. In short, what minorities are being told is that a plethora of identities are fine. It's simply that the ones that they already possess are unacceptable. Squaring this position with either concepts of equality or justice, parity of participation, requires much in the way of creativity and little in the way of integrity. Thank you.